Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you're watching this video, welcome. My name is Peter Loveman, and I'm one of the members of Session at Hope Presbyterian Church and want to welcome you to worship with us this morning. We're using the YouTube premiere option, which means that the content for the service has been previously recorded and then aired live. If you're here watching this live with us, please let us know in the chat section so that we can welcome you. If you're watching this on a computer, that's probably just to the right of this video. If you're on the church's email list, you already have the order of worship with the hymns part of that. If not, you can always download them from the description portion of this video. Our session met this week, and we have a few announcements and reminders. The first is that given the current COVID-19 situation, we're going to remain with virtual services for the foreseeable future. We want to thank everybody who's participated so far and for those that have already signed up to participate in the future. We are continuing to look at other virtual or distanced opportunities for fellowship, Bible studies, and any other way that we can keep in connection. And finally, just as a reminder, if you're a member of HOPE and have pledged um, financial contributions for this year, please continue to do that as you're able um, via mail or auto draft or however you want to do that, please uh, do that as much as you can. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God as we listen to the prelude. Good morning, this is Brenda Brazier, and I'd like to call to worship. No matter how far we wander from you, O oh God, your steadfast love finds us. And no matter how unjust the world seems to us, O oh God, your steadfast, vast righteousness sustains us. No matter how vulnerable our lives seem to us, O oh God, your steadfast presence gives us hope. And no matter how unloved and uncared for we feel, O oh God, you hear our cries, answer our prayers. Thanks be to God.
God of unity and love. Place within each of us a spirit of hope and community. Have mercy upon us when we speak without love or act without humility. Cleanse us in the living waters of your grace. Create in us will and hearts. To live in patience and gentleness, raise us up to be your children. Growing toward maturity in faith and love. Strengthen this church that we may be a model of ministry and unity for all the world to see. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. So hear and believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Good morning and welcome to worship at Hope Presbyterian Church. I'm Stacy Nelson. I'm so happy to be with you this morning. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Listen now for the word of the Lord. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. So glad to be here at Hope Presbyterian Church with you virtually. I wish that I could be with you all in person, but I'm thankful for technology that allows us to worship together no matter where we are. I've been praying for you all this week and I'm confident that God has given me a word just for you today. If you've ever been around children at all, you've probably heard a child try to express something that they have no words for. A thought or an emotion that's beyond their comprehension. Think about a young child trying to express their love. They might stretch their arms out and say, I love you this much. They might use an expression like, I love you to the moon and back. Or here in the South, you might even hear an expression like, I love you a bushel and a peck. That's one that me and my daughters used to say to each other all the time. Well, these idioms are all futile attempts to adequately describe something that's difficult to understand. These are all ways that we as humans try to comprehend the incomprehensible. Now our text today is part of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And Paul was in that same predicament. He was trying to express to these precious saints something that he said was incomprehensible. 
Now, Paul established the church at Ephesus on his second missionary journey. He later returned and he taught and preached there for several years. He sometimes preached for up to five hours a day. So these believers at Ephesus were well-versed in the basics of the Christian faith. They had a good start. But now Paul is writing to them from prison. He knows he will never see them again. So as you can imagine, he put a lot of thought into what he wanted to say to them. His words reveal to us the magnitude of God's feelings towards us as his children. And we know from the events in Acts chapter 20 how much Paul really did love this church. At his last meeting with the elders from the church of Ephesus, he prayed with them. And then scripture tells us that their goodbyes were filled with hugs and kisses and grieving and weeping because they knew that it was their final goodbye. When we read Paul's letter to the Ephesians, you can feel this deep love. It's almost a fatherly love that Paul had for this church. Since he thought that this would be his last communication to them, he probably thought about what they might be feeling so that he could write words that would be comforting to them. This group of believers at Ephesus probably felt unloved at this time. Paul had spent years preaching God's love and grace to them, but now he couldn't be there every day to remind them of God's love. And there's something else you need to know about this group of believers. They were vastly outnumbered in Ephesus. Ephesus had probably over 250,000 people. And the majority of those people worship pagan gods. They lived in a culture where idol worship and occult rituals were the norm. So this small body of believers just didn't fit in. Ephesus was known for being home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a massive temple to the goddess Diana. This temple was longer than a football field. So these believers lived in the shadow of this great temple to a pagan goddess. But Paul wanted to remind them that they are now the temple where the Spirit of God dwells. He reminds them in Ephesians 2 not to feel like strangers or aliens, but to remember that they are citizens of God's kingdom. Paul uses imagery in the last part of Ephesians chapter 2 to tell these believers that they are living stones in a new, holy, and spiritual temple to God. Now this new temple is greater than the temple of Jerusalem, and it's definitely greater than this temple to the goddess Diana that these believers walk past every day. This new temple is made up of living stones of believers from all nations. This new temple is so magnificent that even the heavenly hosts are amazed at its glory, a glory that comes through Jesus Christ. So Paul used this temple imagery to remind this dear group of saints that even though they feel marginalized, God's love for them is larger than the challenges of their current situation. Paul was saying, God loves you this much. Now let's explore together the many dimensions and complexities of the love of Christ that Paul mentions in this text. Just like a beautiful diamond has many facets, when we begin to look at the multidimensional love of Christ, we can begin to see some of its greatness and glory. When I was studying this passage this week, I realized that the love of Christ is multidimensional in its origin, it's multidimensional in its function, and it's multidimensional in its essence. So I want us to look at each of those areas today. Now what we have here in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 
is Paul's prayer for this group of believers. And this prayer is also my hope for each of you today. So Paul prays for this group of believers that they would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Hmm, to know something that's unknowable. That seems like an unfortunate paradox, doesn't it? Well, it would be an impossibility for our human minds, but the resolution of that tension is found in the opening lines of this prayer of Paul. Look at Ephesians 3.14. Paul begins by saying, I bow my knee to the Father, that these saints would be strengthened in their inner being by the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. So the first piece in solving this puzzle of knowing the unknowable is the multidimensional triunity of the Godhead. The only way that Paul's prayer for this church could be answered is through the power of God whom we experience every day as creator and savior and sustainer. In our humanity, we can never begin to understand the things of God like his great love for us. But by the Spirit, we can begin to grasp it. God is love, and love is from God. So love, the love of Christ, originates from the multidimensional person of the triune God. Well, next, the love of Christ for us is multidimensional in its function. It is an anchor and a foundation for us as believers. In Ephesians 3.17, Paul prays that the church will be rooted and grounded in love. The basis of our faith is multidimensional and is both sustaining and supportive to us in our faith walk. Both of these terms, rooted and grounded, speak to the security and the growth of the believer's faith. Now, rooted is an agricultural term. Think about the roots of a plant or a vegetable. They soak up the nutrients. And the roots of a plant also provide stability so that the plant's not blown away by the wind. Christ's love for us is just like that. It's the nutrient that causes our faith to grow. And when we look at nature, growth can be a slow process. The love of Christ nurtures us and sustains us over time and provides stability for us as we grow into mature Christians. Now the term grounded is an architectural term. The ground floor of the building is the foundational floor. When you think about constructing a building, you always want to have a good, solid foundation. Well, Scripture tells us that Christ is our chief cornerstone. The love of Christ is the foundation of our faith and life. So Paul wants these words here, rooted and grounded, to paint the picture for us that we stand in life with both feet firmly planted on the foundation of Christ's unfailing love. Now, Christ's love for us is also multidimensional in its essence. In our text, in Ephesians 3.19, Paul prays that these believers will begin to grasp the breadth, the length, the width, and the height of Christ's love. So what does this really mean for us? Well, what really got my attention is that Paul prays that believers will start to understand God's love in its four-dimensional essence. When something is multidimensional, it becomes a lot more real to us. Now, whenever there's a big blockbuster movie that comes out, like Star Wars, my kids always ask, can we go see the 3D version? They want to put on the glasses and they want it to look like the objects are, are coming off the screen towards them. Well, on a few occasions, 
we've been to some amusement parks where we've been to four dimensional movies. So now not only are objects coming off the screen towards us, there's an extra added dimension that makes it a little more real. We've been sprayed with water. We could feel the wind blowing through our hair. The seats were moving. And we could even at some point smell different aromas like an apple pie baking. It made the movie come alive and made it a much more real experience. So that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here for us. By describing Christ's love in these four dimensions, he wants it to become alive to us. And he wants us to experience it in a much more real way. So let's talk about each one of these four dimensions. Well, first of all, the love of Christ is wide. The width or breadth of Christ's love that Paul describes here talks about a love that's as wide as the world. When Paul used that imagery about the living stones in the temple, it included people from all nations. So when you think about our world, our world is a sphere. You can circumnavigate the globe so it never ends. The love of Christ is so wide that it's never ending and accepting of everyone and includes everyone. No one is beyond the reach of Christ's love. It's a love that reaches to the poor, to the privileged, to the immoral, to the prideful, and to the marginalized. But it's only by the power of the Spirit that we can begin to grasp a love this wide. There's nothing that you have ever done or ever will do that can exclude you or anyone else from this love of Christ. The next dimension that Paul talks about is the length of Christ's love. Now this refers to the lasting power of the love of Christ. Paul told the Ephesians that Christ's love for them existed before the foundation of the earth. He said that they were destined for adoption as, as God's children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of God's will in Ephesians 1.5. Christ's love for us is longer than eternity past and is everlasting. Now, some of us have been abandoned by people in our lives who claim to love us, but they didn't really mean it. But Christ's love for us is permanent. No matter how many times we fail, Christ's love will never let us go. He's committed to us that he loved us from eternity past, and it's a long and lasting love that will never run out. The next dimension that Paul talks about is height. The height of Christ's love refers to our union with the exalted and ascended Christ. Scripture says in Psalm 103 that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Christ's love for us lifts us up to where he is. In Ephesians 2, 6, it says that we were saved by grace and we were raised with him and we're seated with him in the heavenly places. So part of the gift of our salvation is that we were raised with him as a new creation. And the fourth dimension of Christ's love is that it's deep. This dimension of Christ's love refers to the fact that it's deeper than any pit of despair or sin that we might find ourselves in. The depth of Christ's love for us describes Christ's sacrificial love on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. So oftentimes when we think about dimensions and units of measure, it's something that we can quantify. But notice here that the dimensions that Paul describes, the love of Christ, are all infinite. But thank God that we serve the God of Ephesians 3.20 that says, he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. 
Now, even though this multidimensional love of Christ can't be measured, that doesn't keep us from beginning to experience it. The deepest place in the ocean is the Mariana Trench, and it's over 36,000 feet deep. If Mount Everest were submerged into the Mariana Trench, it would be completely covered with water. Now, we have been able to explore some of the depths of the Mariana Trench, but because it is so deep, we don't know exactly everything that is down there. But that doesn't keep any of us from wading in the water when we go to the beach, right? In that same way, we can experience more and more of Christ's extravagant love over time. So how do we begin to grasp the fullness of this multifaceted love of Christ? Just as the kingdom of God is coming on the earth but has not yet fully been realized, we begin to know this love that surpasses knowledge by catching small glimpses of it all around us. The beauty and splendor of flowers and sunsets and clouds and stars remind us of that love that reaches to the heavens. The faithfulness that we experience in healthy, loving relationships give us a glimpse of the love of Christ in our lives that's long-suffering. When we reflect on the love of Christ that covers every one of our sins, that grace compels us to return forgiveness back to those who have wronged us. And when we look at the faithfulness of the saints who have gone before us, that great cloud of witnesses we're reminded of Christ, our cornerstone, our anchor, in whom everything holds together. God's love for his people throughout the ages gives us a glimpse of God's love that's longer than eternity past and is everlasting. No matter what Hope Presbyterian Church faces, God is with you. God loves you with a love that's higher and deeper and wider and longer than you can imagine. So when you think about these dimensions, about the height, depth, width, and length of Christ's love, which one of those dimensions that we've talked about this morning really resonates with you? I encourage you to meditate on that dimension this week. It's my hope and prayer that we can all begin to grasp the extravagant dimensions of God's love. Because then, just like the church at Ephesus, who were surrounded by a culture that disregarded God, no matter what we face in life, we can rest in the peace and security that comes from gazing upon extravagant, unending love. I pray for you just like Paul prayed for the saints of Ephesus, that you can begin to take hold of this love that surpasses knowledge so that you can be filled with the fullness of Christ because God's love for you is no ordinary love. It's multidimensional.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we pray now for the needs of the church, the whole human family, and all the world, saying, hear our prayer, that churches of all traditions may discover their unity in Christ and exercise their gifts in service of all. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer that the earth may be freed from war, famine, and disease, and the air, soil, and waters cleansed of poison. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. We pray that those who govern and maintain peace in every land may exercise their powers in obedience to your commands. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer that you will strengthen this nation to pursue just priorities so that the races may be reconciled, the young educated and the old cared for, the hungry filled and the homeless housed. May the sick be comforted and healed. We pray to you, O oh God, hear our prayer, that you will preserve all who live and work in North Alabama in peace and safety we pray to you, O God, hear our prayer, that you will comfort and empower those who face any difficulty or trial. We lift up the disabled, the poor, the oppressed, those who grieve, and those in prison. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. We pray especially today for Reverend Christy Ashton, May she feel your extravagant love surround her now. Now, church, join with me in praying the prayer that our Savior Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's been my joy to worship with you virtually at Hope Presbyterian Church this morning. 
And now, as we go into this new week, may God strengthen you in your inner being. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. May the Holy Spirit plant your roots deeply in the abundant richness of God's love. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. As